The entire book of Third Nephi is a story of spiritual maturation, of ascent, beginning with really the depths, the abyss, the darkness, the earthquakes. Those early chapters in Third Nephi are tumultuous, not only physically, but politically. You, you wonder, why does it begin with so much darkness? Why does it begin with Satan reigning with blood and terror, with political upheavals and the whole government essentially collapsing? The darkness at the beginning of Third Nephi shows what this world and life is like without the light of Christ, without the atoning sacrifice that brings us back into good standing with the Lord. And what is unmistakable in Third Nephi is that he calls on everyone. It doesn't matter who you are to repent and come unto me, to be one with him. As soon as this marvelous experience is beginning to unfold, the disciples are told to go out and bring as many people as they can the next day. Come. And I imagine there were plenty of them who said, I can't come. I'm not worthy. Or maybe I'm too skeptical. But the crowd that assembled the second day was even larger than the first day. And those were people who responded to the call. They came when someone invited them and said, I want you to come. You won't be disappointed. And they weren't. I cannot imagine a text making the contrast between darkness and light more powerful than what we have in Third Nephi. We go from stark total darkness, three days of not knowing when that darkness would even end, to a brightness above the noonday sun. As Elder Jeffrey R. Holland once said, the God who turns the darkest night into morning light had arrived. I can't imagine hearing the words of Jesus that we have in Third Nephi and hearing them for the first time and not being completely overwhelmed with the, the brilliance, with the insight, with the lights going on spiritually and intellectually. As I hear Jesus and as I read these words, I try to imagine the face, the expressions that would have been on Jesus' face. As he said, each line, I think the expressions would have changed. There's a face of earnest instruction. He wants to get my attention. He wants to be sure I understand. There's a face of love, of invitation. There's a face of warning. There's a face of inviting where he wants me to know that he is the good shepherd and he will gather us all into his fold. I love especially the images of Christ when he is smiling. In Numbers chapter 6 it says, may the Lord's countenance smile upon you. And in 3 Nephi we have that blessing fulfilled as nowhere else. It even says, and his countenance did smile upon the people, and he gave them his peace. I cannot imagine seeing those faces and not knowing that Jesus loves and wants each of his brothers and sisters, each of Heavenly Father's choice spirits to have the blessing of transfiguration as did the three Nephites, to have the dew of resurrection applied to each of us. Uh, that atonement is a, a personal embrace. 
there can be nothing more profound, more intimate, to even contemplate the, the immediate embrace of the Lord. To have him embrace you and to cover you with the robes of his righteousness, those arms are extended to us always. And as I take myself into the, the kind of experience that that would have been, I, I say that is what is real. That is what real existence is all about. I know from the account that I read in 3rd Nephi that the pain and suffering that Jesus bore in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the Mount of Calvary had cosmic effects. They were felt all over the world. They were real. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was in a battle. He was fighting against the powers of death and destruction, of chaos and confusion, winning a battle for my soul and for the soul of every human being on this earth. And I know that if we will make even the slightest efforts in his direction, he will bring us carefully along on the path, the straight and narrow, that will lead to life eternal.